would like to uh, deal with the la very last video. The last video is going to be a treat. This is uh, the gentleman you see here. His name is Divine Prospect. Uh, he's out of Atlanta, Georgia. He's also a Hebrew Israelite. And he's going to take a look. What I believe he's holding a class with his students, looking at the verse uh, Deuteronomy twenty-eight sixty-eight, and dealing with some of the things I brought up earlier about the need to ensure that you understand the nuances, the uh, original languages of the Hebrew, and not draw conclusions based on a myriad of references and lexicons, but take the time to understand something about the language before you draw conclusions. Let's proceed. To be. Unto you. Okay. You shall see it no more okay. again. Okay, keep going. And there you shall be sold. Now slow down. There you shall be what? Sold. Sold. Unto your enemies. Slow down. Now you reading what? The King James? King James. All right. Now, family, I'm not saying throw the King James out. I will never say that. What I am saying is that in certain instances, the King James has it right. Some instances, the King James has it wrong. Tell it. And unfortunately, for a lot of us who have been dogmatized with that particular part of the text. We use the King James Version to justify it. King James... Uh-oh. Divine prospect. You're going to get in trouble. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but he's making a, a, a very important point, um, is that, um, like I said earlier, I grew up on King James. Many people did. Many people, uh, and it's, a, it's a good translation, but there, there are challenges in certain passages in the King James Bible. And that's why you need to understand the original languages. Uh, so many of, of the uh, ideas that the Black Hebrew Israelites uh, purport come from thoughts and ideas that they read into an English translation that may not always convey all of the idea and expression of the underlying Hebrew. And that's what's going to come out in this discussion with his students. It says what? And there you shall be sold. Okay, and there you shall be sold. Now, if we, were, if I was to write the word, and there, oh, I have it here. And, and you shall be sold, and there you shall be sold. The implication is what? And there you shall be sold. What is the implication here? That someone, someone else selling is selling you. Someone Somebody else is selling you, right? And read the rest of it. And there you shall be sold unto your enemies. Unto your enemies. For bondmen. For bondmen. And bondwomen. And bondwomen. And no man, and no man shall, buy you. shall buy you. Now look over here. Now, we see some translation says the word slave. Bad translation. Slaves, the sense of slave in their time is different than a sense of slave from what happened in the transatlantic slave trade, right? Because there's two different That's right. contexts. That's right. Two different periods of history. Two different oppressors, etc. Right. Yeah, all of that. So what he's saying is significant. Uh, when you start taking words uh, like the bonds, bond woman and uh, bond men, uh, uh, those words there, they're used uh, for slave in, in that verse. And you start to import uh, an idea based on the 1619 transatlantic slave trade. You're, you're actually obfuscating uh, uh, the actual meaning that was conveyed in the actual passage. So, that's it, what he's bringing out is nothing controversial. It's nothing deceptive. It's something that every student of the Bible needs to understand. I say that because the correct term there should be bond men and bond women. Now, I have two lawyers here, right? What's a bond? If somebody gets arrested, they go where? They go to jail. So they go to jail. Go to jail. But a family member goes where? To the bail bonds to bail the bonds do what? To make a bond. Because a bond has to be set. A bond is a certain amount of money that has to be set to get you out. Okay. I mean, you can go to a bill's bondsman uh -huh. to put up a bill, uh -huh. which is a smaller amount, uh -huh. to secure that you will return to court if the judge lets you out. There you go. Now, look, the same sense was back then at that time. So don't think in the, the slave sense and the buying sense. Think as a bondman and bond, meaning that they, a price was set for them to be bought. Now, here's how you know you have an issue here. If it says, and you shall be, and there you shall be sold to your enemies, right? So the sense is somebody selling you to your enemies as bondmen and bondwomen, and then the rest of it says, and no one shall what? Buy you. Buy you. Buy you. Now, how does that make any sense? Yeah. Think about it. If, you're, if somebody's selling you to your enemy or another party, 
and they're not going to buy you, why are they selling you? Right. Exactly. Think about that. Does that make any sense? No. So your enemy, who's a straight, strong, great nation, is going to take you and sell you to somebody that's not going to buy you? That doesn't make any sense. Turn to the and another thing I want to bring out, I think is important. <clears throat> He's making really a, a, a strong logical case. But the thing I don't want to uh, dismiss is the actual Hebrew. Regardless of what uh, Divine Prospect says, what is inescapable, uh, even though he's making some good points here, what is inescapable is the Hebrew. So you might say, well, I disagree with what you're saying, uh, uh, Divine Prospect. But what is inescapable, again, is the Hebrew. The Hebrew is reflective voice. The Hebrew is an intense action. So regardless of what example you want to use, you cannot escape the fact that this is an action someone is doing to themselves, and they are very passionate about doing that action. We'll proceed. Actually, we know slavery, but barter, trading for etc. Right. Okay. The, the Western world. The Western world. So now we have to re-examine this, right, in light of the language. And I'm going to show you why parsing is important. And we're going to parse this real quick. Now, there's, there's various things in here, but I'm going to stay with the basics so that way the wow. audience can go back and research it and you can you can pick it up, right? I don't want to go too deep, right? So, and you shall be sold. So now we're going to see that this translation is wrong, okay? And I, 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 well, any one of my students can talk to you. Whoever is good with what I just went over. You? All right. He says wrong. People are going to scream, no, no, Divine Prospect. We can't allow that. No. What, what Divine Prospect is doing is what any student of the Bible should do. He's not just importing his meaning into the text that's called eisegesis. He is allowing the scripture, all of what scripture says. That means the language which uh, that verse is actually being presented in. Uh, he's allowing it to speak. It's not about some rhetoric. It's not about some dogma. It's about what do, do, what do these words actually mean? And so he's going to take time with the students to break down some of these details. Uh, <laughs> I didn't mean it like that. <laughs> you think, huh? All right. All right, so look. So now I'm going to erase this. And I'm gonna, we're, going to, we're going to redefine what this says, this word is. Right? Okay. Take this out. Well, I didn't get to show you these suffix, but the suffix is the implication of you or y'all, right? That's the suffix. Okay. All right. So now, oh, let me get this out of the way. Yeah, it's over there. Okay. You can do it. You listen. All right. So if we were to just write the consonants out of this, this would be, this could be a Y or a B. This is a H. Hey. This is a Tab or a P. Uh, this is a M. This is a ka, which we would say is a k. This is a resh, which is an R. We take care of our people here in the congregation. The Hebrew congregation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I have we have the research. We got our speakers. We got our elders over here. Whatever you need, we take care of our people here in the Hebrew congregation. Right. Yes. After this commercial break. This is this is how I transliterated it, right? Uh, oh, I got this. All right. So before we get into this transliteration, I want her to identify certain things, right? The first thing I want to identify is what did I say this word? Shiva, consecutive Shiva. No, 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 not consecutive Shiva. Just, I mean, just, just, I mean, just this symbol, the diacritic mark. Oh, you said Shiva, 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 right? Yeah. And that means what? It's like a pause. Just in a simple pause. sense, a I mean, pause. Yeah, it's just a pause. Yeah, it, it means, means that. Yeah, it means that this consonant is an indicator within this word. Right? So that's what that means. Now we have here this wah, and this is called the what you said? Consecutive. Consecutive wah, right? Now, what I didn't show, and I'm going to show it here, is that when you look at a root, a root verb, right? Like, for example, I went over this. This is an easy one that everybody can recognize, right? What is this word? No, no, this word. K Y K is opposite. Part of the most high thing. Hey, yeah. why hey means what? To exist. exist. Be, yeah, to exist. But there's no modifier to put it in the imperfect tense. So without the modifier, it's in the perfect tense and it should be past tense, right? Mm -hmm. Here sometimes people say it's a state of verb or it could be a state of being because be is just a state of being. It's really not an action, it's a state of verb. 
but here it can just can literally mean existed because there's no modifier to put it in the future tense. So in Hebrew, you have perfect and imperfect. Perfect means it's a completed action. Imperfect can mean it's an action that started at some point and is still going on or an action that will take place. The best way to identify is reading the context of the passage or even the chapter to see if it's speaking about past tense, I'm sorry, present tense, something that's continuously going or something that will happen in the future, right? Now we saw the word there, it says, and you shall be so, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Divine Prospect is correct. You, uh, with uh, biblical Hebrew, uh, you cannot, there's nothing in the actual uh, text that tells you anything about the tense. So the tense is always determined by the context of the verse that it's in. So uh, good thing that he actually pointed out. The point is, what is he doing? He's actually explaining in detail how you determine the meaning of the verb. So uh, very good so far what he's doing. Shout, shout is what? Past, present, or future? Future, future. They give you the future implication, right? Mm -hmm. All right. So consecutive while we went over earlier means what? It's a it's a biblical Hebrew, mostly and only, and it's in a narrative sense, right? Mm -hmm. For literature, right? And you don't see it in a lot of colloquial speech. So the consecutive wav is here, and when you have this consecutive wav, it does almost the same thing as this yod does to this word, right? Mm -hmm. So the yod is third person. Third person. Oh, stuff. And this is this is how you see it sometimes in some. It'll be like this, right? So it just means third person, masculine, singular, right? So this is number, gender, and um, number, gender. I'm sorry, person, uh, gender, and Tips. number. Right? Mm -hmm. So person, gender, number. So third person would be he, she, they. Masculine, here we mean it would mean he. And singular won't be they, it would just be he, singular, right? Mm -hmm. So third person, masculine, singular. So when you add this here, this also puts it in the imperfect tense. So before it could have been existed. But now when you modify it, it says he will exist. Right? So that's the modifier. Now the consecutive while does the same thing. The root word will be perfect tense. Anytime you have a verb that's not modified with a prefix, it's in the perfect tense. When you modify it, most of the time it'll be in the imperfect tense. And the consecutive while puts it in the imperfect tense. Okay? So that's the first thing we want to see. That means whatever the, the regular state of this verb would be, which would be perfect, the consecutive verb makes it imperfect. Mm -hmm. The next thing is this right here, the hay mm -hmm. and the top, right? Mm -hmm. So the hay and the top is a um, it's a modifier, right? Mm -hmm. So the hay and the top, we went over three different verb right. stems, right? We went over ka, which is the active voice, nifa, which is the passive voice, and the hit which is the reflective voice, or the person talking about themselves or doing. So you you hear that? The hit file. He said it was what? It was, uh, if you can hear that, I know the, the volume may be a little low in his end. And also, uh, he appears to be having a, view, a few video technical uh, challenges there. But uh, I hope what you were hearing right there, he said the hit pile is what? A reflective action. It's a reflective action, meaning what? We just covered that. Something you do to yourself. So he's in agreement with actually what the Hebrew is actually saying. He's not... Uh, dogmatically just reading something into the text, but allowing the Hebrew to, to speak. Action with themselves in mind, in mind. So now that's indicated by the hey, the hit it, which is it, and the ta. And anytime you see hit, it indicates the hit fire. So bring up um, the, yeah, by, the blue letter bottle. Because I want to show people the error a lot of people make with the Hebrew language, right? when trying to click on it, when trying to explain certain things. And this is a perfect, it's a perfect example. Oh, so the first thing is, first thing, oh, sorry, yeah. All right, so uh, I want you to click on H4376, all right? Now, uh, what was I saying? Uh, okay, so what a person will do is they'll click on H4376. This is why knowing Hebrew grammar is important, because if you don't know Hebrew grammar, you won't know how the root word is modified. Right. So what I teach people is that, how do you find the root word? 
you first have to understand these, these prefixes and the suffixes. So the root word is what? Makar. Makar. Point out to me. Where is it? Oh, wait. Right here. You got it? Yeah. Can you see? Yeah. Okay, got it? All right, so the root word is what? Makar. Makar, right? Yeah. And K-R, right? Makar. Uh -huh. And then we have what here? Okay. Which means that we're going to, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to, we have this. This means something. Uh -huh. We have this. This means something. We have this, and this means something. Uh -huh. So when you look up the uh, Strong's, the Strong's will only give you the root. It's not going to show you the other modifiers to this verb. And that's so that's important. You hear that? So, you know, like the Sakari group just went back to the Strong's. They're like, see, we go to Strong's, Makar, uh, to sell. Hey, that's right. You don't get the, all the other modifications in the Strong's. And so you, you, you're, you're basically like a three-legged dog. I mean, not to, uh, using pejoratives or not being, uh, patronizing, but I'm just saying you're at a disadvantage when you do not understand the language. And so when you, you saw earlier when, uh, Sakari was going through and saying, see, see, I don't see anything where it says to offer. Well, that's because you don't understand the language. You're not going to get that all those level of nuances going through the strongs. You actually have to know about verbal stems and you have to know about all of the things like the modes and the voice and all of those things that we just covered briefly. Uh, that's very, very, very significant to understanding the underlining meaning. Good things that Divine Prospect is bringing out. A uh, demonstration of when someone doesn't understand how to use a lexicon or they don't understand the underlying Hebrew from Sakari. And finally, someone that's at least attempting to deal with the original languages in order, in order to understand the underlying meaning. Very, very important because a lot of times when you try to decipher the language and you're reading the text, the first thing people do is they'll go straight to the strong and coordinates. And they'll say, see, it means this. In this passage, no, it doesn't mean that. You're just looking at the root. You're not looking at the modifiers. So a person that knows Hebrew will look at you and say, well, that's not right. That's just like if, I, if you look up the word, uh, if, I'm, if I'm speaking a sentence and I say, uh, Jane has understanding of the Bible, right? And let's say there was a Strong's next to the word under, understanding. And um, we go to the root, and the root gives us the word understand. And we would say, if you go back to the sentence, see here, see here, it says understand. If we didn't know the language, we say, see here, it means understand. And somebody who knows the language says, wait, wait, it doesn't mean just understand. You have I-N-G, which is the present participle that's added to it. So that's how we have to know some grammar so that way we won't just take a strong word and say that's what it means in the context when it doesn't mean that. The second thing is looking at the various, go ahead, Makar. Go scroll up, scroll up, um, down, I mean, down, down. Okay, down a little bit more. All right, a little bit up, a little bit more. I just want I want all of this up with a little down a little bit more. Um, use the use the hand. No, nah, it's not going to work. All right, so that's okay. That's okay. Leave it here. All right. So what a person will do is they'll click on the strongs. They'll go here to see this entry, and they'll be like, uh, let me see, pick one, pick one. Uh, to be sold. That's what it means. There it means to be sold. All right, remember that before? And uh, quickly, I know the page he's on. I believe he's uh, in the Blue Letter Bible page with the lexicon from Makar. And so remember, let's go back there real quick and take a look at that. So remember this page? Yes, which option should we pick? Well, if you don't know about the hith pile, then you're like, oh, it just means to sell. Someone sold us, see? Oh, or to be sold, or to, we don't know. We don't know because we don't know the grammar. See, that's the disadvantage. You're not going to get that with a lexicon. You need to understand something about the grammar. And that's a, a great point that Divine Prospect is mention, uh, mentioning. That's a big deficiency that I see among the Black Hebrew Israelites. But here's the thing. They're, if they actually started looking at the grammar for Deuteronomy 28, uh, 68, oh, then that whole transatlantic slave trade thing uh, may fall to pieces because it doesn't fit the narrative. So let's continue with the video. And they'll, they'll say it automatically and not understand why these categories here, why A, B, and C is here. They will have no clue why those three things are there. 
And a person that knows Hebrew will understand what these things mean because they'll go back and look for the modifiers to the verb and they'll know what sense is being referenced, whether it's kal, which means the active voice, nifa, which means the what? Passive, passive. voice. And hitfa means the reflective, reflective voice, right? So you see here, to be sold, to sell oneself, this one is to sell, how stands. This is to sell oneself in the reflective sense, right? Because remember, reflection has to do with the mind, and a lot of times it has to do with introspect and retrospect, depending upon the situation. So now, if we were looking at these three entries for the word makar, we looked for the indicator, which was what? Hey, Back over here. Hey, it was the hey, the hey, the hey, hitic, hey, and the time, or the th, right? The hit. Well, let us know when we go back here to the root. Oh, it's in the hit pile sense, which means to sell oneself in the reflective sense. That means I can't use Kyle, I can't use Nephile, I can only use entry C. And that's the problem when people don't understand Hebrew, is that they'll just pick one and think that's what it means. That's not what it means, okay? So let's get back, let's go back over here. So she identified a consecutive one with the Sheba, which means that this means something. She identified the hit pile, which means what again? So it's reflective. Okay, so it's a reflective, but it's the it's the it's a person reflecting on themselves. Right? You have the root word here, which is what? Makar. And then we have tem at the end, which indicates like a you all, because uh, that's plural, right? Right. Tem means almost like you all, or you all, or y'all. You know what I'm saying? Y'all, right? So now, if I if, if we were to go back and reword this, and I'm gonna show you how the translators work. If we used to go back and reword this, how would you how would you translate this? How would you parse this? Or how would you translate this? And we All right, this is the moment of tr truth. Remember the Sakari group said, Where is offer? Where is offer to you know, they, they were saying that uh, unfortunately they were saying that uh Makar, that the primitive root, uh Hebrew root uh was uh that that we were arguing, um, Vocat Malone and many others are arguing that uh, that yeah, they were saying to offer, but they don't understand that the, the whole phrase to offer oneself is all of what is being expressed in the grammar uh, expression for Makar in that verse. And so let's see what direction uh, the Vine Prospect and Company go at this time. Let's continue. Go back and reword this. You have consecutive wild, you have the hit ayal, you have the root word makar, and you have ten. Y'all, so you have uh, and will, and will, you have reflection on oneself, right? To be sold, y'all, or you all. Mm -hmm. So how would you go back and, and translate this? How would I translate that in the... In English. In English? Yeah. Um... You there you go. Say wait, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. And, and you, you will, will sell. Yep. No, no. And you will. So you got the and will uh -huh. you or y'all and y'all will hit hit high as what? So. No, no, no. My car is reflected. Reflected. Oh yeah, myself or me. No, or, I. or or ourselves, or, or, or yes. and you will sell yourself. Yourself, like yourself. yeah, okay, yourself. Okay. And so now this is added on to here, right? So and you will, and you will, and you will sell. sell the root word sell uh -huh. yourselves, yourselves, your own selves. Yeah, your own selves. And so you and you will sell your, your own selves. selves, right? And you will sell your own selves, but. I would translate it as, I would, instead of saying you would sell your own selves, it's almost something like the passive. Uh -huh. I would say, um, and you, you sell will sell yourself. Yeah. And you, and you yourself will sell And you will offer. Offer. Oh. Right? So reflective is more contemplative mm -hmm. in the abstract sense, right? As opposed to a physical selling off. So reflective is, and you will offer yourselves mm. offer so there would be more of an offering than a literal selling there because it's in a reflective sense okay. if, it, if it was and you will sell yourselves it would most almost be like a nephile sense right which we see up here 
But here is more like an offer, something that's abstract, something that's like a deal that you're doing. Yeah. As a, like I said, when you go in, we, exactly. There you go. Like like a job interview, right? You have you're yeah, right. You have a resume, and you are there to sell the resume or sell yourself yeah. to the person that's going to hire you or the buyer. So you're offering, you're making an so offer to them of yourself. So you're not literally giving yourself or selling yourself to them. There's no transaction, literally, but it's an offering of yourself, mm -hmm. right? In a reflective sense, it's an offer, right? That's more reflective. To Nephi would be more physically, I'm selling myself, right? Almost like prostitution, and you'll see that sometimes in some other places with prostitution. Mm -hmm. It'll give you the sense of it, right? So here's the end. You will offer yourselves. And you and you will offer yourself. So yeah. no longer you will be sold to your enemies, right. but and you will offer yourselves to your enemies. And then the rest of it says what? Very, very interesting, right? Very interesting. Um, so that's why it's so important to understand Hebrew grammar. I can't, I can't stress it enough. I, I know I might sound like a broken record here, but you see the ESV, that wicked, allegedly wicked ESV or NSAB, because I know the NSAB and both the ESV use the word offer to sell some variation of that oneself. Um, there's nothing wicked about that because it's respecting the underlining Hebrew grammar. If you understand that, you wouldn't say that, but because you are, defending something dogmatically without the knowledge to substantiate it, you're forced down this emotional roller coaster that you don't need to get on. Get off that ride and get on the ride that that where you actually are learning uh, about the actual original language. Uh, very good information presented thus far. As what? As bonds. As bondsmen and bondswomen, bondsmen. not slaves. Bondsmen are bondswomen because the offer has to do with a price. Right. And I gave an example of that looking at uh, Ruth and Naomi, right? And you had a king's re kingsman redeemer, right? And his job was to do what? What's the kingsman redeemer job was to, to do? To buy back. To, to buy back. Right. So a purchase or a transaction is being made, correct? All right, so a bondsman, a bondswoman, so you're offering yourself for a price, a slave is just giving themselves. Um, and somebody just, just no take them. You, sometimes you can buy a slave, sometimes you don't have to buy a slave, right? Because it, be, it can be a spoil of war, mm -hmm. right? A war, you can go in and fight a war, and you take the spoils. They're not selling themselves to you. You're actually right. just taking them, right? right. So this, a bondsman is more specific. So a bondsman, bondswoman, and what? And no man and shall buy you. And no man shall buy you, you right? Click on H7069. Redeem. There you go. Redeem. Purchase redemption for a price, right? Mm. Or it could be it could, it could be higher if you're offering yourself. All right. So we have the word kana there. Kana, go down. Slow. Buy, get, purchase, possessed, owner, recover, redeem. But in most senses, it means buy or transaction, right? Now slow down. Okay. Now also we have here the cow stem. Keep going. The knee foul stem and the hit foul stem. And now, the Hitfeld stem is a causative action, right? Because you can have the causative active voice and the causative passive voice, right? Go back to the verse. Okay. And it says, and no man shall buy you, right? So no man shall buy you. So when you talk about a man, no man shall buy you, we're talking about, uh, you had to um, uh, read the last two at the bottom. And no man shall buy. Okay. And no man shall buy. The implication is you. Mm -hmm. Right? And no man... Oh. oh, I was trying to go to the end. Okay. And, no, and no man shall buy you. Now, we look at the King James, and we see a word italicized. What does that mean? It was added, 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 added to the text. Added for context. That means it's not originally there. Okay? Right. And it says, and no man shall redeem, no man shall purchase, no man shall buy you. That's the conclusion of what I want to present. Three different videos. So you see that in three videos, one where... There was a presentation from IUIC where uh, Deuteronomy 2868 was pretty much dogmatically said, this is what it means. It's talking about 1619 transatlantic slave trade. You saw the video presentation from Sakari, which was some type of rebuttal, uh, I guess, response against Vocat Malone, where they said he was misrepresenting Deuteronomy 2868. But 
in their presentation a woeful lack of the understanding of the original language uh, demonstrated in how they uh, just went through the lexicon just without any understanding of how to deal with Hebraic roots and how to actually deal with the verbal stems and how the fact that the concordance lexicon doesn't even address any of that. So you're 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 left without a valuable understanding uh, of what that verse actually says. And so you're basically left to picking based on your own personal proclivities, which is not how you do uh, rightful biblical interpretation. And then you saw the third presentation wherein Divine Prospect with his students uh, made great pains and great efforts to understand the original language. And you saw uh, that based on uh, proper working and understanding of the verbal stems, the, the voice, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the kinds of actions that are used, which is called the aspect of the, of the mode, uh, the verbal mode, they were able to come with a correct, proper interpretation. Now, that interpretation was not a notion that was foisted up on the text. It was derived from the text. And so that's a, uh, a, a distinctive difference. That's a qualitative distinction between all those two prior presentations. Why do I bring this up? I know that there will be perhaps some Black Hebrew Israelites that will watch this and think, you know, what's my agenda? What, what's my angle here? My angle is there's no angle. There's no agenda. It's simple. I want you, if you claim to know the Bible, to know what the word of God actually says. And if you are uh, appealing to Deuteronomy 2868 as a proof text for the 1619 transatlantic slave trade, in light of what the Hebrew actually reveals for Makar to sell, that no longer holds any water. In light of what the word actually means uh, to offer to sell oneself, there is no foundation for the transatlantic slave trade anywhere in that text. And so to use this as some type of leverage, some type of pointer to say, this represents us. These are this this verse is talking about uh, those descendants of those who uh, came from the African continent through the transatlantic slave trade routes. Uh, there, there's nothing there to substantiate it, because what this text is clearly talking about are individuals, Israelites, who volitionally, voluntarily deliberately sold themselves of their own volition to others. And there was no buyer. And that buyer there is not talking about some man redeemer in some type of salvific sense of taking them from their enemies. There was no one to give them money. There was no one to secure the transaction. So an offer there it by no means means that their, that their payment will come to fruition. So we we see the clear representation of the text. And my challenge to, to any of you who are watching, once you have the clear and incontrovertible presentation of the text, you have one or two decisions to make. You have a decision to make, really one decision to make. Do you accept the clear teaching of Scripture or do you hold fast to your tradition and dogma and reject what the Bible clearly demonstrates and, and presents. And so I'm asking all of you black Hebrew Israelites to repent of the falsehoods, the, the, the misapprehension of the scripture, the, the misapplication of these verses, and hold fast to what the Bible says. If you are in any doubt, review all of what's been presented. Uh, be uh, uh, Have that Berean mindset to, to not just take my word for it, but to be a diligent student and, and rightly divide the word. And so at this time, I, I appeal to you and I thank you for the time that you have, you have spent watching this rather lengthy video, but I, I pray was a very edifying video as well. You take care and God bless.